So Colonel Wealth, the New Zealand's best, most awesomest index fund provider. Yeah, an investment platform and now KiwiSaver provider. That's right. Yeah. Why don't you tell me a little bit about the, the business I had Dean on? Must have been close mm. to when I first started doing this podcast almost yeah. five years ago now. Yeah. So how, how old are yeah. you guys now? We're turning four in a couple of months sure. or in about two months. Um, so yeah, we kind of started small in the sense of offering New Zealand-based index funds. So investing into the New Zealand market. Since then, we've expanded. We've now got 19 funds. We wow. started with three. That's right. Yeah, four years ago. So yeah. quite an expansion in the fund range, including expanding into, um, you know, diversified funds. So what people would be mostly familiar with in the Kiwi Saver space, conservative, balanced, high growth, mm. um, but then also focusing in on some of those sector or individual market funds like the S&P 500, NZX 20, NZX 50, Globe 100, those kinds of things. Where do you think most people are coming from at the moment? Great question. A lot of word of mouth. Um, mm. We've seen a lot of growth. Our KiwiSaver has only been around for the last um, year. It's kind mm. of recently had its one year anniversary. Okay. So a lot of traction coming into KiwiSaver, I think driven by the fact that there's been so much good education out there, particularly on behalf of the FMA, to get people engaged with the KiwiSaver after the large amounts of kind of switching and panic movements that went on during COVID in terms of people, you know, reacting, moving yeah. into conservative. Um, so that's been really pleasing to see. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah. We're talking broadly about intergenerational wealth yes. today. Yes. And uh, when I was doing the research for this, man, it really started to hit me just how yep. this really is the core reason probably why I do financial advice myself mm -hmm. and why I'm so passionate genuinely about this because I'm yep. doing it at home as well. Yep. And so it's a big one. Let's it is. talk about what we were talking about though, before we hit record, yep. which was around that ASX research, the Australian Soccer Scene did some research in Australia and it found something that we often kind of focus on the negative, but this yeah. was a positive story. Yeah, so absolutely. So, yeah, so I think um, for anyone that wants to, I guess, dig into more of the details, ASX provide a investor survey that they put out about every five years that basically surveys everyone that kind of, you know, participates on the stock exchange from individual retail investors through to some wholesale investors. Um, and they provide insights on the types of people and I guess the demographics of the people that are investing in various financial products in Australia. So um, probably no surprise, they kind of categorised uh, the groups of people into, you know, your typical millennials or kind of your acute accumulator age, and then also your what they've called your young investors, which would classify in your Gen Z, um, through to your pre-retirees and retirees. Now, one of the questions that they asked across all audiences was um, around their goals. So, you know, what are you investing for, basically? What are you using these financial products for? And interestingly enough, the primary answer to come from the youngest audience was generating a passive income. And then one of the follow-up questions was what types of investments, you know, do you typically tend towards? And again, the strongest answer from that young audience was uh, investments that have stability. Okay. So one would kind of usually assume that people in hmm. close, you know, approaching retirement or in retirement would be the types of people that would be looking for stability and passive income because they rely on that from their investments. However, what they saw from the survey was that it was actually kind of the complete opposite and it was the younger gen that were much more focused on those two um, aspects of, I guess, life yeah. than perhaps the older audience was. And I felt that that was an interesting point to start the intergenerational chat because we're kind of pretty quick generally speaking, um, to jump down, you know, younger investors' throats and kind of say they're ill-equipped to manage money, maybe they don't know what they're doing, we should be worried about how much money is going to transfer. But that to me was a really, really good starting point to say, hey, actually, maybe we should be giving some younger investors a lot more credit than we have been. You're right, like what we probably assume and I guess the only thing that I would like I, on one side, I'm really super impressed and yes. I, I would put it down to social media and yep. how maybe they see what's coming down the pike and they kind of prepare the mm -hmm. vessel for what they know mm -hmm. might be coming later on. Mm -hmm. On the other on the other hand, I'm, I'm kind of looking at that going, well, I wonder if, if they're looking for things like passive income and stability, which are 
like no volatility and high yield, right? Yes. If they're looking for that at the early stage, I wonder if there's a risk that they're too dialed into conservative investing mm. strategies as they first mm -hmm. start learning about Absolutely. investing. Yeah. Because in reality, they probably shouldn't be chasing yield and stability when they're starting out, should no, they? No, exactly. And I do also wonder if it speaks a little bit to the generational shift that we're seeing about, you know, work, flexible work and employment, and mm. whether it's something that I guess younger sure. generations are maybe seeing passive investment created from or well, passive income created from investments as like the panacea to maybe being able to work a bit less. I'm not sure I'm buying into that that's going to be the future of work, particularly for my one-year-old. But, um, <laughs> you know, there's food for thought there, but absolutely right. You know, there's got to be an understanding of the fact that passive or passive income actually comes from having really strong base of, you know, yeah. equity investments or wealth right. in income-generating assets. Yeah, you got to grow it before you farm it. Yeah. Uh, the ASX research that you mentioned, I'll, I'll mm. find a copy of that. I'll put it in the show notes as well as several Bloomberg articles that yeah. I read this Perfect. morning. And that's where a lot of these, these questions have come from. It's cool. me, me just kind of, there's a few videos I watched on YouTube, about six or seven articles. And then I, I'm trying to remove my, um, <clears throat> my own bias as a father yes, and as a financial advisor. Mm. I'm just trying to look at this purely from the point of view of, what really the everyday investor probably looks like. Mm. And if I was to guess, maybe half of people out there would have some sort of inheritance yep. of varying different magnitudes. Yep. Um, and that assumes that their parents will die gracefully and yes. in a very prompt manner, yeah. right? <laughs> but as we know, that doesn't happen. And so people will be thinking a lot about these issues probably in a different way. And they might it might conjure up some feelings of, um, Morbidity? Uh, morbidity. Yeah, I was gonna, <laughs> <laughs> some very morbid feelings. A bit of doom and gloom. <laughs> a bit of doom and gloom. Or even almost like a sense of, hey, where's my fair share, right? Yeah. And, and it yeah. is quite sad. Like I fall in this mm. category where there's really nothing upstream that, that flows into me. Yes. And I, I look at that as a blessing and a curse mm. because I know that as a result of that and as a result of my upbringing in particular, I probably developed a very strong appetite or mm. desire to grow wealth because I knew what it was like not to have that base there. Yeah. And so I recognize that as a really good attribute, although it's quite uncomfortable and it's still, mm. it feels quite like that feels honestly, like if yeah. I was to distill what drives me forward as an investor, it's still that. Yeah. It's that sense of need. I need to get yeah. something so that that doesn't perpetuate my family line. Sure. Um, and I know that other people that don't have that, it's probably the same but different right yes. like from a yeah. from a just a person yep. thinking about parents yes do you you don't have to tell me what what's upstream from you yeah. but do you kind of think like that as well like hey yeah. would it be a blessing or a curse yeah i mean it's a really good question and i think it's um one that i had thought a lot about in a work context because as you know but listeners may not i had a background in financial advice similar to you but working with you know a lot of high net worth individuals in australia and of Thank course you. in any kind of high net worth conversation there's naturally going to be a strong element of discussion around intergenerational planning estate planning what that kind of looks like mm -hmm. and I had, you know, well, as many advisors or medical professionals would say, you know, they're very good at telling other people what to do and maybe not so good at kind of implementing it themselves. And it's yeah. not until becoming a parent myself in the last year that I have now started to have to, I guess, put myself through the paces of like, well, you know, we have things like an investment account for our daughter, but actually what does that mean? When would we tell her about that? How would mm. we teach her the value of money? Um, you know, how do we teach her about assistance that we may get from our grandparents through, you know, inheritances or mm. gifts? Um, should we be open about that? How comfortable are you kind of sharing your balance sheet information with those around you? Because you don't want to scare them in the sense that, as you highlight, like people can hold on to that type of yeah. um, experience from a like financial age very, very early that can be a motivator, but can also drive people into like quite a scarcity mindset if they're not, um, you know, communicated with effectively, right, rather than necessarily also towing the path of like, well, we don't want to just be doing handouts or worrying about what that might look like. So 
it's very top of mind for me at the moment because my husband and I are redoing our estate planning. And of course, they ask you all the tricky questions when you're doing your will around, you know, in the worst case scenario, what it would look like. And it's really forcing me to think through, okay, well, we have life insurance, like how would, where would that go? What would happen to our house if it was sold? You know, who gets management of that money? What's that money actually really for? Um, And so, yeah, the joys, I guess, of being a parent kind of force you to think through some of this stuff. Um, But to your question of, you know, it does sometimes feel a little bit unbalanced in terms of whether you're a person that is creating wealth that perhaps is going to be passed on for the first time in, you know, a family line. Um, One thing that I did have a bit of data on, unfortunately, Australian data, but some related data for New Zealand. But in Australia, it's interesting that um, so they estimate that in the next kind of well, in the next two decades, there's going to be three and a half trillion dollars transferred from baby boomers to their millennial children. So I'm a millennial child. For anyone that's not quite sure, millennials are currently in the age range of about 31 to, well, 30 until I think it's like 45. Yeah. yeah. Is our friend, so millennial children and then their grandchildren over the next two decades. And based on the population in Australia, that's an average of $320,000 per person. Wow. So that is a material amount of money. That's average. Yeah, when you're talking about inheritance across that group of the population. Um, I don't have the same kind of per person data for New Zealand, but Mm. that said, based on the last census data that we have, those that are in kind of the baby boomer generation, Mm. um, they will be, well, they in New Zealand hold 63% of household net worth. Which That's is amazing. <clears throat> yep, pretty yeah. high. And this story, by the way, is quite consistent with the US as yes. well. So it's yep. not too dissimilar. Exactly. Yeah. The trends are all the same. The numbers are obviously just slightly higher in Australia yeah. and the US based on population size and economy. Yeah. But for us in New Zealand, it totals $1.15 trillion yeah. of wealth that will transfer over the next two decades from kind of that baby boomer group down sure. to millennials and those below yeah. them. So, you know, to your point, for a lot of people, that will be a first time transfer you know, potentially, because um, I think you see, particularly in the baby boomer and um, Gen X generations, you know, people that have immigrated here, um, perhaps, you know, started again for their families, you start to see all of those stories come through. And, you know, New Zealand is a country of small businesses. Um, A lot of people create a lot of wealth, not only in their homes, but their businesses and work and how that kind of plays out into the next generation is something that we haven't seen in such scale. And that's a really awesome insight. Thanks. Yeah. Like that's quite mind blowing that amount because yeah. wow. Yep. But it's not just the magnitude. It's, it's the, it's probably the qualitative piece of it as well, because I'm mm. guessing say in the United States or in Australia in particular, that wealth is possibly in the form of more equities perhaps it absolutely is rather yeah. than property or business yeah, exactly like, well the interesting stat that i do definitely remember from the hsx survey because i was blown away by this is 51 percent of australians have investments outside of their home or their superannuation sure wow okay that's pretty high i haven't seen I, that data for new zealand but i'm just I, guessing it wouldn't yeah, be as much I, it would definitely or not, not a significant anywhere. amount anyway no and and that's important because of this thing called liquidity mm-hmm. and it's really Diversification. hard yeah Yep. If, if mom and dad have a beach house in Omaha mm-hmm. and their home is in St. Helier's and they're worth $6 million, but those are that's where all their wealth is. Yeah. And they've got four kids. And then how does that play out? And what does that look like in terms of asset splits? It's a very different, I think, situation. Well, potentially a different situation in this kind of wealth transfer that we're facing in New Zealand because of the skew of assets and types of assets that we tend to invest in. And also the fact that, um, you know, not all of those baby boomers have been, well, have had KiwiSaver for their entire working lives, right? So a lot of them have had their wealth funneling into property or their own home, whereas our generation and our kids, their futures will be part, you know, KiwiSaver will be part of their kind of end asset base for their entire working career, yeah. which again is a little bit different. Yeah. I guess we can not understate how awesome it is, though, that general financial literacy from where I sit anyway, it really yeah. does af- appear to be higher Absolutely. than even just five years ago when I yes. sort of first started yeah. kind of learning about this. Exactly. Like it's, it's, yeah. That's really encouraging. And I know um, when you started your podcast uh, with Christine, the yeah. It's No Secret podcast, Yeah. that that was what, three years ago? Yeah. Something like that, yeah. three years ago? 
and maybe at the time there would have been mine and four other yeah, podcasts. Yeah, I was going to say probably like five in total. <laughs> yeah, and now uh, it feels like everybody's doing it. Yeah, um, and they're There's all lots of conversations, yeah, different, all different topics. Ones and, and yeah. it's not not a big deal, like for me to yeah. s- reach out to somebody and have a conversation with them on the show. Mm. People don't ghost me as mm. much as they used to, because mm-hmm. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. a bit easier to. Because it's like, well, yeah. I don't have to explain what a podcast is to start yes. with. But the dissemination of information that is normally reserved for the hoity-toity in the inner yeah. circles—that's now you know, those walls have broken down. Yeah, and that's fantastic. And it I think. Is. I wonder where that all goes. I hope it all goes in somewhere good. Yeah, right? I think so, and I think you know. Uh, I'm interested to see how it plays out in this space because as someone who has been a participant but also an observer in the whole conversation around how hard it is to get onto the property ladder, Mm. I have always had in the back of my mind, given the types of people that I've worked with from a financial advice perspective of like, yeah, but does that tend to go away when we see this wealth transfer happen? And I know that that might be a bit controversial to be like, well, we're just... Do you want to explain that a bit more? Yeah, well, I mean, on the one hand, right, it's like, you potentially could be seen to be waiting for your handout. But the other thing is, is a lot of the, you know, my peers, myself included, my husband, well, we bought our first home when he was, I'm going to say 35, you know, the average age of first home ownership in New Zealand is 38. It's quite a bit higher than people hear on kind of the news headlines. Um, But the reality is, I guess, is that a lot of the inheritance or assets that people will inherit if they are younger millennials or Gen Z are going to be property. And so does the conversation around the challenges of getting on the property ladder start to change in the next 10 years, not from the fact that the property market's gotten more cost effective or the fact that we have better housing, but just because this may solve some of those challenges in some way. I, I suspect it will, but only in a very small portion of society. Yeah, that's and true. That whole yeah. inequality thing is just going to get fanned yeah. into flame by yeah. politics again. Well, the interesting point on the, I guess, the US stats around this kind of wealth transfer is they basically are most concerned around the fact that it's just going to spread the kind of extremes of the wealth split between society um, from the lower end and the higher end um, Mm. because yeah, it's keeping a lot of the kind of 2% wealth within an even smaller group and that is of course a challenge. Yeah, it's always the top 1% that controls. It is a pyramid structure no matter where you go. So if you're going to be trying to solve a problem probably solving that pyramid structure mm. in society is maybe one of the ones that you don't really want to mess with too much because yeah. it's not necessarily going to change. Yeah. Maybe not in your watch anyway, but it's probably just a matter of adapting to it more than fighting it is my suggestion. Yes. If I can yeah. say that, I don't want to <laughs> offend too many people. No, but um, yeah. I'll definitely offend a few. Oh. But yeah, it is It is one of those ones where there's going to be, yeah, there's, there'll probably be a lot of wealth that's being transferred onto a new generation. Mm. And it's one thing to think about intergenerational wealth as the thing that's inside the cup and then another thing to think about it as the cup itself Mm -hmm. it's it's interesting just to see Mm -hmm. how your thinking progressively changes as your kids get older and you start that journey with financial literacy in the home yeah and absolutely that's kind of how i look at it anyway is like preparing the vessel so what are some of the things that you're mindful of that you need to kind of start speaking into the live so maybe we could start on words first and i know yes. that you have an eight is 18 month euro 18 months? uh just turned one just turned one so, sorry yeah, okay little. no all good so the whole speaking <laughs> thing is still kind of novel and new it is right. it is yeah but do you know what so i shared this on another podcast recently but um this happened probably about a month ago. So when she was about 11 months, my husband went through the supermarket with our daughter and she was sitting in the you know front part of the trolley that kids can sit in and they got to the checkout and he handed her his phone, which has a case with his cards in it. And as she likes to do, she you know starts pulling things out. Anyway, he's chatting to the checkout person, doing the groceries. He kind of is not really paying that much attention to her. She pulls out a bank card, leans her hand out, taps it on the pay machine to pay pass what she's assuming she needs to pay for and then pulls it back in without being prompted. Now, we have never, you know, played any games with her to, like, mimic that reaction. That is literally just observed behaviour and observed behaviour before, as you say, she can even really talk or she understands what money is 
And we were talking about this in my family because my mum raised a concern of like, well, how are you going to get her to understand the value of money if she's not using actual money? And I said, well, mum, I don't think Lily's probably ever really going to have actual money in her life. Like she's probably going to be part of what is a cashless generation. And there is therefore more of an onus on us as a parent to make sure that meaningless actions like tapping a card or using PayWave on your phone translate into understanding like financial behaviours mm. and mm -hmm. just general economics. But, yeah, that for me, you know, I'd always heard the stat that you learn a lot of your kind of base level feelings and understanding of money by age four and never really believed it. And then when I saw that play out in photos and got told the story from my husband, I was like, wow. This is, you know, starts a lot earlier than you, I guess, anticipate. Do you think that the lack of physicality mm -hmm. around this yep. token of money, do you think yep. that, that, like, how do you feel about that? Because I know that I tried electronically yes. <laughs> using these little devices to kind of simulate yeah. what it's like to have cash with my kids and they never got it and yep. they always kept on breaking yep. and we just moved over to coins and we're still using coins and, yep. and we've now moved to notes. Uh, yeah. It's just I find it really hard to teach them at a much higher abstraction mm -hmm. than just mm -hmm. physical cash. Mm -hmm. Like, what, would you have a view on that? Like, what, well, what what the right way is to teach kids yeah, about money? I mean, that's a great call. I think um, there's definitely no right way, but I think explaining what things cost and the value of money in relation to things is really important because in lieu of having, you know, physicality, yeah. how can they really understand it? Because there is power to counting out the number of coins and recognizing, well, one child has more coins than another child yeah. because of various things that they've done or decisions to maybe buy something. Yeah. And, that, you know, you have that level of implicit understanding that therefore that amount of money is worth more. That's really hard to do if you're just kind of, you know, showing them on an app the number going up and down. Um, so I think th there's probably creating a bit of a like game element around it. I feel like there's probably going to be <laughs> cash floating around our household only for that purpose, That's right. you yeah. know, and a pocket money and learning kind of purpose, but then making sure that you're having conversations to translate that into, well, you know, this is not just an endless money machine, an ATM, or, you know, you can't just whip an iPhone out and tap on PayWave and assume that money will appear. That's right. Um, yeah. Have you, tr well, started that kind of conversation with your kids, Darcy? Do you think they're getting that? Without the physical coins and cash, I just yeah. don't think they would get it yeah. because we're not looking at the screens all the time to sort mm. of understand it. And they're still get it coming yeah. to grips with or our younger one, especially with, with mathematics and addition yes. and subtraction and what do these numbers on a screen actually mean? It's, How did they get there? <laughs> yeah, it's far too abstract. But like yes. just on, on last weekend, I had a, um, like every now and then, we've got, we have three kids, so mm. every now and then I'll try to spend a weekend with just one kid. Mm -hmm. So I did that with the older one and I, I gave him 50 bucks at the start of the weekend because we had to, we were going away okay. and we had to stop and get something to eat yep. and he wanted to go to the dairy and stuff like that. So give him 50 bucks and say, hey, the only rule is I'm not giving you one cent more. Mm. That's it. Yep. And and I had a little chat to him about a whole bunch of stuff around that. Yep. Um, and he did it really well. You could tell he was thinking about it the entire time. But he mm. had the $50 note. And then he got given some change. I yep. got him to check on the calculator. Was that the right amount? Have mm. you figured out what your lunch is going to cost? Mm. And he was slowly starting to piece it together. And then at the end, he had, yes. I think, two or three bucks left over. And I explained to him the significance of that. Yep. I don't believe I would have been able to do that as efficiently if he had to look at his bank account. Yeah. It just wouldn't yeah. happen. Yeah. And so I don't know if that answers your question, but I think we all as parents are probably struggling to be a parent full stop. Yeah. Right? We, we, <laughs> yeah. There's enough challenging yeah, things to, to conquer hard, right? irrespective of a money conversation. Yeah. But yep. put, putting that expectation on yourself mm. that mm. you want to make sure that that vessel is ready to receive the thing that yeah. you're trying to build for yourself as well. Yeah. It's just like layer and layer of expectation and not, yes. I'm slightly older than your generation, Gen X, mm. but it kind of feels almost like we're sandwiched in between mm. uh, parents who possibly got there a little bit easier and they mm. probably didn't have to kind of think about things too much. Yeah. And a generation that potentially has a, a little bit too much entitlement. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Or, or just not enough appreciation mm. of what's going on. I'm speaking mm. about our kids, not yes. in general. Yeah. And so when you're in there, you kind of feel the pressure in both 
sides, right? Yeah. And so it's hard to think and to adapt and to teach people on the fly. But For sure. like, I just think how important, like this is so important, right? Because it is. It's, it's not taught in schools to the extent that it needs to be. Yeah. And I understand that. It's because for decades, our school system has been there to create workers, mm. not necessarily free thinking entrepreneurs that love the free market. Yeah. And so if, if you want better, you've, you're going to have to go against the tide, right? Yeah. Um, but that you, you are, you work quite closely with your husband with, mm. with, with these sorts of things. Like, do you find that you're tag teaming each other in terms of the responsibility for teaching the kids around money or is it yeah. how open are you guys? If you don't mind me asking. We're, we're pretty open about that. I think one of the things I guess I would encourage people to do is if they do feel a bit overwhelmed about like the burden of say, a lesson or you know imparting good habits <clears throat> think less about that and more about the being careful of the like flippant comments that it's really easy to make in the height of a discussion between you and your partner that perhaps a child overhears or you know the offhanded comments that we tend to lean on around money or our reactions to money because give me, give me an example yeah. yeah so i mean um the kind of it, well, one example that I was uh, shared by someone shared actually on our podcast. You probably won't mind me sharing the story because it's already public. But um, mm -hmm. Rebecca Kyle, who's a mum of now three in uh, Christchurch, she has you know her husband works in the police force, so very different work to her. But she kind of runs her own business and works essentially as an influencer and across social media, all that type of stuff. Now, she shared really openly that they were working towards upsizing their home. Um, when they had two kids and so they would often make comments when their kids asked for things like you know can we have takeaway tonight they'd be like no we can't afford that because we're saving for a house now that's a pretty normal comment to make but sometimes when they replied to things it was perhaps a little bit more negative than they realized it was coming off as and one day her son who's her older child came to her and was like mum do we have enough money to eat? Because he'd basically been internalizing these messages and these little comments as like, oh God, maybe we're, you know, very scarce in mindset and maybe we're at risk. And mm. she hadn't realized that that's how it was playing out in his head. Mm. Um, as opposed to the intended kind of message or learning was we're making some sacrifices because we want to buy another house. This is what we need to do to buy another house for our family. And therefore for the next couple of weeks, we're saying no to buying takeaway because we would need to put that money somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So it's just that little, I guess that little nuance of like, I know particularly as a parent when you're tired and like the kids are on you or whatever it is and you just give them the short answer, but it's like maybe just in that moment pausing and giving the slightly longer answer, not necessarily the detailed essay and the whole lesson, but just something that they have a bit more context because they pick up on everything. That's right. And they're going to create the context if you don't provide it. And instead of saying we can't afford it, how can we afford it? Or yeah. we don't want to do that because if we do that, it means we we won't be able to do this. Yep. Yep. Like exactly. that, it doesn't have to be a lot longer, but just a little bit yeah, longer. Yeah, just a bit longer. And, you know, because those types of questions I'm imagining for your age kids do tend to come up of, you know, oh, why massive. does such and such a school have this and we don't? Or they start yeah. to interpret and understand differences in people's lives. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if we don't explain to them that that is often to do with differences in choices, not just differences in wealth, they will just interpret in whatever way that they want. You know, another one I talked about recently was... Um, one of our nephews asked his grandmother one day very innocently, and I'm going to say this is probably at age four, like, Nana, why does granddad have a boat and you don't? <laughs> Which is a very loaded question if, <laughs> if she was to give him, you know, the very long-ended answer. But those are the types of moments where I guess if you just stop and take a couple of minutes, you can potentially impart quite a good lesson versus just giving them the easy out and not yeah. having to engage. Yeah. It's fun, isn't it? Oh, it is. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah. But it's important as well. Like, I don't think it's really that hard. It was hard a while back. It's mm -hmm. not hard these days to explain to people that the new world that we're heading into might be quite different to the world that we're even in right now today. Yep. And as a result, we need to invest differently and invest in different things. And we need to think differently yep. about stuff. And I guess it comes down to this intergenerational wealth that mm. we as parents are busy trying to work. We're trying to keep a lid on our spending and invest the best, the best mm -hmm. we can. Sorry, invest the rest, the best we can. Yep. And at the same time, we're trying to teach our kids to do the same so that whatever's left over from us can go onto them and they get yep. a head start. But 
Um, how important is it that we do that? Like really, because mm. going back to what we started with, mm. is that going to be a blessing or a curse? And I guess yeah. what I'm getting at is, is it better to instill a sense? You know, I don't want this to come across the wrong way, but is it better to allow there to be a sense of anxiety, hunger, thirst, lack, mm. a deficit so that they yeah. come to their own conclusion or should we foster Such a good trade off? I, I mean, so one thing I kind of look to in this space is the whole idea of lifetime giving, but the balance of that. And the reason I bring this up is because um, just was doing a little bit of research work on this recently. And because there are estate taxes in the UK, the concept of lifetime giving is super, super popular mm -hmm. because as one it's would imagine, yeah. if yeah, if you know, as everyone does, that your life is going to end and you have, you know, more money than you're going to use in your lifetime, then you would like that ultimately to go to your family in its maximum capacity. So this kind of concept of people getting to, I guess, almost their 50s and then starting to part ways with some of their money to either their children or grandchildren with often a lot of assurances around making sure that they're then still looked after in the future for me is quite appealing in the sense that I like what you say about you want to create some hunger in you know those generations below you so that they have some drive and desire but the easiest way to learn is often through doing and it goes back to that kind of adage of if you can't manage $50,000, how are you going to manage $500,000? Um, and I think it's a little bit of that in the sense of there can be a lot of power in giving some, you know, whether it's your kids or your grandchildren, money in their lifetime to watch them manage, watch them observe, see what they do with, provide ample opportunity for discussion or resources or coaching to help them manage is not only going to give you comfort that in the future they will then hopefully um, put anything else that comes their way to great use, but also gives you opportunity to course correct if they don't put it to great use mm. um, or to set up other structures to ensure that, you know, perhaps they're safeguarded from their own worst habits, shall we say, mm. or, or partners with terrible habits, um, or, you know, decide to just blow it all yourself in, <laughs> in your retirement. But I think, yeah, there's a lot of power in that. And it's not something that we see a lot of here in New Zealand because, of course, there's no estate taxes. And I think there's this, well, there has been a strong lack of desire to talk amongst generations and family and wider whānau around like conversations around money, right? Yeah. Very slap happy, the attitude towards yep. money. Uh, yes. In, in New Zealand, it feels yes. very, very casual for the vast majority of people. And yep. maybe that's been fine, but I just don't think with the world that we're heading into, that's fine enough. No. So I think, yeah, going back to that lifetime giving sort of concept, mm -hmm. we see this often a lot when like I'll be working with clients and we'll be talking about the concept of buying your kid's first home mm -hmm. at today's price mm -hmm. as one of the ways to help, help your kids in the housing market. Because yep. that's like one of the top three concerns that parents would have For is, sure. will my kids ever get into the housing market? Yep. So idea is simple. Parents, they buy an investment property, yep. which then hopefully over time grows in value. They then mm. sell it to the kid at mm. the price that they paid, yep. maybe a little bit extra, but not much. Yep. The difference in price between what they sell it to and what the market price is, is gifted equity. Yeah. And that combined with setting up KiwiSaver mm. for the kids, yep. taking advantage of the low tax rate, yeah. indirectly lowers your tax on your investments. And then you create a really great strategy to help them in the housing market. There's obviously yeah. a lot in that, but the idea is that you're doing it now so that you can see the results while yes. you're still alive. Yeah. And, and they can enjoy it whilst you're also still alive. You yeah. know, it's that thing of like, you still get to enjoy, I guess, the fruits of like the hard work that created the money in the first place all together as a wider family, rather than just be hopeful that at some point in time, this will benefit your children. Yeah. Like if you don't do that, what's the alternative, right? You, yeah. You do it yourself and you grow even more wealth. And meanwhile, your kids are really struggling and yeah. they probably... I don't know, maybe the resentment grows because they mm. know over mm -hmm. time, they know mm -hmm. what's going on. And so mm. what, what do you do? You give it to them all in one big lump sum when you're dead yep. and they're nearing retirement and it mops up the mess, but yeah. are they really equipped to handle it? Yeah. I don't know. Cause you yeah. haven't actually been doing anything. I know. You've been waiting. So it's, it's a really complex area, isn't it? It is. And the, it is. And the right answer is different 
for it, different people, right? I think it definitely is. I think, I mean, one of the things I would definitely discourage people away from doing is just kind of this idea of like setting an investment or a QA saver or savings up for a child or a grandchild and putting all the hard work of, you know, growing that for them until they're 18 and then just giving it to them and hoping for the best because I've heard so many horror stories where that just hasn't worked out and not horror stories from the parents, funnily enough, but horror stories from the recipient of that money who maybe didn't make very good choices and then had time to reflect on that you know five ten years later and realized that that was an opportunity that they were never going to get back um mm. and you know i saw this recently whereby um a really kind grandparent had basically saved up a ton of money for their grandchild's life their grandchild had turned 19 and they actually just got a bit frustrated with having to manage it like they were just like oh i just don't want the life admin burden anymore i'm going to give it to my grandchild now and that hasn't really played out well because there's been no journey of taking this person on, you know, education or understanding the time and the amount of effort that had been put into growing it to what it was. And, you know, you don't necessarily want to come into gifts with too many strings attached, but I feel like there needs to be some gates along the way to either encourage the person to seek out education themselves or to force them into it so that your hard work hasn't gone to waste inadvertently by them making you know a choice on a whim that's right that's fair totally I feel like that's, yeah completely fair <laughs> so uh, so really what you're giving them in terms of a wealth transfer isn't the fruit it's the gardening i don't yeah. know it's yeah. the this is how yep. we do it yeah it's exactly not, it's not the result of it because yep. i there's probably a certain amount of pride there as well i guess from the donor on mm. the donor's end mm -hmm. There's maybe it's private. They've never talked about money. Mm -hmm. They've taken on themselves the responsibility to do something good yep. for their kid or their grandkid. So they just go about and do it and they might yep. feel really good for themselves. that They've done this amazingly awesome thing exactly. without realizing actually you possibly have just burdened that recipient yes. with something pretty heavy. Yeah that yeah. they may not be yeah well equipped at that point in time and yeah. i think you know one of the things we often saw in australia was people also trying to almost direct things from the grave a little bit too much in this planning and i'm wondering if this has maybe come up with any of your clients but yeah. you know Definitely. almost going too far into the kind of planning of like the classic one that um was so well intended but hilarious was working with someone who had done very well in their own business and basically sold their business and they were deciding what to do with the proceeds of the business. Now at the time they had two children who were I think from memory about like seven and eleven so quite a way off being first homeowners themselves obviously yeah. um, but their dream was to buy a big block of land that they could cut into three sections they were going to build their dream family home in the middle and then they were going to build a property on either side that their children would move into Darcy when they turned 18 and nice. they would live there happily ever after on the family compound now we obviously <laughs> well maybe not obviously we tried to reason them against this for a number of reasons, mostly because I think, um, you know, we don't know as parents what our children want to do in the future. Um, and this is one of the reasons why sometimes we say to people like, there is flexibility in having, say, an investment account for a child in addition to or instead of a Kiwi saver, because your child may not own a home in the same capacity that you do in the future, or maybe they want to move overseas, or maybe their dream is starting a business. And sometimes we can get a little bit too prescriptive with how mm. we think this money or this inheritance has to be used. And ultimately, like, do we want to be prescriptive or do we want to empower them to make a really good choice? Great question. And I like if you wanted to buy your kid a property, right? It it doesn't mean that they're gonna live in it, but no. maybe that property is an index just to allow a foot in the door. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And I think, you know, it's having conversations with people around like there is a difference between kind of, I guess, setting them up well for success in their future and defining what their future is. And ultimately, the goal of intergenerational wealth should be to help provide them security. But we can't really define what that security looks like. No, I know. It, this is a really complex issue. It, <laughs> it is. is. <laughs> Which is pro probably why I like, I like it intellectually as well. Like yes. I like it because there is no right yeah. answer with this it's a, and it's yeah. a big can of worms and i can see yeah. why people shy away from even talking about it or thinking you know that they want to talk about it and i do think also like when you hear the term intergenerational wealth to your point at the start a lot of people might feel like oh that's not really applicable to me 
but intergenerational wealth doesn't mean inheriting yeah. like hundreds of thousands of dollars. It could be as simple as inheriting, um, you know, some proceeds from a, pro- a property or the remainder of, you know, a parent's KiwiSaver balance, which mm. may be tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. And that can still be material and meaningful for someone's life. Yeah. So it's not about the amount, but it's about having the discussions and thinking through what may be coming down the line for your family in the future. Yeah. I just think it's all about the vessel. It's not about the substance, right? No. But that whole fungibility thing, right? Where the dollars that come from Aunt Mary Mm. is special. You cannot do that apart from just this one purpose. That's kind of like what you were saying before around giving directions from the grave, right? Which you've actually just hit on a really good point because – I hadn't thought about this, but also having worked with a lot of, you know, accumulators and younger clients in the advice space, the well, I can pretty much guarantee you that anyone that inherits money of any capacity is usually um, racked with some kind of emotional trauma, guilt, whatever it may be, high stakes feelings around that money. Mm-hmm. And they typically tend to find making decisions around that money a lot more difficult than any money that they have earned of their own volition, right? So when you add that in with, you know, the potential for overbearing parents or, you know, grandparents trying to like tweak things from the grave or whatever it may be, you're already in a time of that person's life that's probably a little bit stressful because they've lost someone that they care about. They will definitely have a lot of emotions tied to that money you know, I think at that point, it's like, you want them to focus on that, not on making solid financial decisions. And so you do need to take the time in your living life to make sure that they're they're going to make solid financial decisions so that when they get to that point, they're not overwhelmed with all the things, you know, and they can kind of sit on it in peace for a bit of time and then decide from there. Yeah. All the more reason to get advice if, if, and when that happens, because it's, absolutely. The stuff that doesn't happen for you, you can't play this passively. Uh, The stat that I'll drop on is, I think it's a fairly well-known stat, or at least it is according to (laughs) ChatGPT. Approximately 70% of wealthy families lose their wealth by the second generation Mm. and 90% lose it by the third generation. That actually Mm. comes from an article, so I'll put that in the notes. Don't worry. Uh, I don't take all my financial (laughs) advice from ChatGPT. Don't worry, people. But that's quite fascinating. So let's say you and I, with our families, we managed to become Mm -hmm. super wealthy. Mm -hmm. We then give it to our children. Yep. 70% of that gone. gone. I know. And then with their kids, 90% 90%. of it gone, right? Yep. Which is, I guess that's good from the point of view of if you like, and, and this is where I'll try my very best to conjure the deep socialist within me. But if I was to think, hey, that's not fair that all this wealth is concentrating Mm. within smaller amounts of people Mm. over time. Well, hey, good news. After two generations. It'll be ruined. It'll be gone. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) It's gone somewhere else. Trust me, it's it's in the economy. It's probably not in the government's coffers, though. And that's that gives you a clue as to where that message really comes from. Yeah. So I guess to to say that there's a problem here is an Mm. understatement. And then when we overlay that with a massive amount of wealth locked up in the baby boomers that will start to flow through. Yes. I wonder, like from a macro perspective, just how inflationary this is all going to be and just how that's going to change the dynamics. Like will Mm. higher value properties, Mm -hmm. like how will they perform relative to smaller value Mm -hmm. properties? Mm -hmm. Uh, Particularly if you're thinking about like from a New Zealand centric point of view, you know, we know that um, we're very heavily weighted towards like residential property from an asset household wealth point of view. Mm -hmm. And typically speaking, well, people have mostly more than one child. Um, And so when you're looking at like asset splits and the price at which those properties have potentially inflated to, one question that pops to my mind is, are we going to see more asset sales in the residential property space at that kind of higher or like mid Mm. to higher end? Because if I play that out, I have one brother, let's say my parents owned a home here, they don't, they're in Melbourne, but the same thing theory applies. Either one of me or my brother wouldn't have enough money to buy the other sibling out. So therefore the only default is to sell the family home and split the asset that way. Um, And yeah, exactly to that point of like, how does this tend to flow out in terms of assets Mm. overall in the next couple of years? Because on the flip side, I can think of some other reasons why luxury properties would actually perform super well. well, Exactly. uh, Because of lending lending rules, right? So yeah, it's just, this is is the world that we're heading into though. Like all the rules now almost 
you have to dump them out and yep. put them back into the basket in the way mm -hmm. that makes sense to you because it ain't going to be the same way that it worked yep. in the past, in my view anyway. Absolutely. So giving, giving now, not later, that's one of the things. Mm -hmm. Sharing your plans as a family, being really yes. open about yep. the discussion with money, yep. that obviously makes sense and just wherever there's sunlight, it's going to be the best disinfectant. So if there's weird beliefs with you and your mm -hmm. partner, mm -hmm. yeah, you got to work through it. Yeah. Unfortunately. You and your siblings. Um, I think yeah. that's the other oh, one, man. you know, yeah. people obviously focus on making sure that they're having the conversation within their own household. But if you are also, um, you know, someone that is going to inherit money and you therefore then need to start conversing with your siblings about money if yeah. you haven't done that before that for a lot of people is quite scary um you know it's one thing to i guess have the conversation directly with a parent mm -hmm. particularly if it's coming from an angle of understanding their finances so as they age you have the ability to potentially help them or just have an awareness of what they have should decisions need to be made mm -hmm. but then how do you make sure that you know, families with multiple siblings also have an understanding. Everyone's kind of on the same page um, and and it kind of goes down from there, right? Yeah. Estate planning, really. That's it is. kind of it. Yeah. And it's not something that, hey, this is this is the job of this person. So it's like everybody in the financial services realm, there's a this overlap, right? Yes. So, for example, like an insurance advisor is really important here. They're not necessarily mm -hmm. going to give you full on estate planning advice. But they will, if it's tangential to figuring out how much life insurance you need, right? Exactly. Because it's about the right amount of money in the right hands at the right time. Yep. So that, that has to speak now to the will. Exactly. How does the will get set up? Well, you probably talk to a lawyer. How do they know what to put in there? Well, there probably needs to be a little bit of estate planning mm. gone in here. And yep. well, how do we find out what the purpose is and what the long-term objective is of our family? Well, that's probably where you need to start considering things like a family charter. and. Yep. Just, yep. Or at least a financial advisor or someone that totally. can be kind of that independent voice of the family Hello. to yep. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sense check some things. <laughs> You're a step ahead of me. Come on. <laughs> Let me just mention some words. Tell me yep. what, what this triggers in you. Okay. Okay? Gratitude, generosity, entitlement. Oh, it's such a tricky one. Um, do, do you know what? I think the, the thing that's probably the most difficult is generosity because – I honestly believe that a lot of entitlement comes out of well-intended but potentially misplaced generosity in the sense of giving without the educational support that we've talked about, maybe, I guess, sharing information about how wealthy or successful a family is, but without sharing the details or the, you know, the, I guess, the understanding of effort required to get to that point. Um, you know, I, I do think that to back to the very start of the conversation, there is a lot of credit to be had to having conversations around work and hard yeah, effort totally. with your children and making sure that they understand that, like, yes, we may have money now, but we're not potentially always going to have that money or, you know, we have made bad choices in the past. It's the same thing of, you know, we'll always – probably shine the light on our positive stories with our children, but not so much the negative stories. And mm. I remember so distinctly in my own childhood, um, probably have, well, definitely have much stronger memories of situations where my family was under like financial stress, mm. as opposed to having a better understanding of when that was not the case. Um, okay. And it's, done me well in the sense that I'm like I know that I can recognize now that there were times when you know okay we could go on a family holiday every year and we went skiing and maybe we got to overseas every couple of years and that was obviously because mum and dad have worked really hard and been successful but I also very distinctly remember times where businesses had failed you know potentially a bad property investment hadn't gone so well and I knew that there were swings and roundabouts and so if you shy away from also sharing those negatives mm. that's where i think entitlement can tend to breed sure you know because you're kind of painting the golden picture all the time and we know you know as a business owner that that's not how wealth is created or mm. you know people become successful i hear you and i guess it's like you probably i don't know like maybe it's instinct maybe it's more of a, a man thing i don't know mm. where you kind of want to impress your kids by how yep. how amazing you are yep. right um and people it, want to provide security and yeah, and yeah. like surety to their children and stability. And that is completely valid and I think also needs to happen. But 
that doesn't need to, well, that doesn't come at the cost of also being honest about yeah, when yeah. things are potentially challenging. I guess we're talking about humility, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, And absolutely. just acknowledging things for what they really are without yep. putting a spin, good or bad. Yep. Because humility is just seeing things accurately. Absolutely. But what what you said was was interesting there around that generosity that if in the absence of generosity, I can't remember your exact words, it's more likely that an attitude of entitlement comes about. Is that what you said? Yeah, I, th- I think so. And I think that sometimes almost like misplaced generosity can also encourage entitlement. So the the over generousness or the, the grand gestures of money, the, you know, lump sum gifts out of the blue from a very positive place, like that's all very nice and well, but I guess it's, you know, you got you need to give people context. Otherwise they sure. potentially do just start to I expect think, yeah, that. You, you're you're touching on something which is really important, I think, because if we're not bringing the kids along for the entire journey, they're only going to see parts of it, which will give them a skewed understanding. And Mm -hmm. and that means they're lopsided in their growth around. Yeah. Well, that's actually a really fantastic thing. And, you know, kids observe us at work, right? They know how, particularly for any working parents, like how much time you're able to spend at home versus at work. They will Mm. have more of an understanding of particularly, you know, with kind of working from home, floating here, there and everywhere. Mm. And so I think with that also provides the opportunity to ensure that they have context of like, this is how I make my money or this is where our wealth comes from. It's from this thing. It's not from that thing. So going back to that work ethic piece, that that is important. It's not just work in the actual hands-on work of investing, which might be say, getting your hands dirty with with tenants yep. or sitting down with a financial advisor and reviewing a plan and strategy and all that sort of stuff. Exactly. But, but even just work full stop, I've often been in this awkward zone where I feel like I'm either an extremist mm. or I feel like I am um, onto something. I yep. don't know why. I'm, I'm either way out crazy mm-hmm. Or I'm doing something that's really important. And what I mean by that is I, I really do genuinely work my kids pretty hard. And they'll yeah. tell you that. And I'm not ashamed to say it. But they they will work. Oh, and I, yeah. I won't go into details. But like they, they do work before yeah. we do fun stuff. Yeah. And we've taught them that from day one. Mm-hmm. And they know that when I go to work, it's so that yes. we can do all these other things. That to me feels like probably like. 80 to 90% of the struggle mm-hmm. in terms of what I think I have ahead of me with preparing the vessel yep. is in that. Yes. Because if they understand where money comes from, yes. how you can get it and yep. how you can be diligent, creative, yeah. open-minded yep. to get more of it, yep. then it kind of washes away the sins yep. that can occur if you make bad decisions, right? You can Agreed. get back on the horse. Mm. But I don't think, mm. and maybe this is a generational thing because maybe our parents did something that made us this way. <laughs> I don't think my generation, maybe it's different for you, but I yeah. don't think my generation works their kids hard that enough. Hard. And I'm sorry for those that are all my friends or anybody <laughs> listening, but I don't, I don't oh. think we're hard enough on our kids. Am I out yeah. of line with that, with saying that? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, of I course think... you'd say that. You're, uh, well, you're, you're, you're in my I mean, podcast I mean, studio. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think it's definitely, it's a really good food for thought. And I think you're right, Darcy. It's, I like the fact that you're focused on, I guess, teaching the value of work because if they have the skills and tools to know how to create wealth, Mm. it's okay if they take a misstep. You know, because if they know that, sure, as long as I have the right kind of ethic or um, ability to apply myself in a way that's going to result in an outcome, I can always do that. It doesn't matter if, you know, the thing that I applied myself to was potentially not the thing that worked out because everyone's going to have those missteps. Um, But, yeah, you're right in terms of making sure that they – have some kind of pressure (laughs) for lack of a better word put on them to make sure that they do learn that because arguably you don't necessarily learn that at school yeah outside of perhaps exam time and the ability to is that is that work or is that just playing a game well exactly and for some children that's completely you know is the wrong kind of way to teach them about i guess applied effort and work ethic anyway um and then you know, unless they're starting fruit picking or some other random job at the age of 12, which I'm guessing not many kids are these days. You haven't met my children. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this is going to be so no. offensive to some people. Oh, I, I know. No, but, it's hey, good. It's, it's yeah. worthwhile noting. And I mean, look, I think 
it is interesting on the in like the wealth transfer or the intergenerational part though because going back to the whole first gen makes money second gen kind of ruins it a little bit third gen blows it what they say typically happens there is it's because the second generation were witness to the hard work that the first generation needed to put in to make the money in the first place the third generation being the grandchildren of the grandparents that did all the hard yards didn't witness any of that. So they have no concept or appreciation for the true effort required to build the base that they've inherited. So what you're talking about is exactly that, but it's essentially doing it in the reverse way of build them the skills so that if and when they have money... (laughs) Yeah, that's right. You know, you're yeah. just trying to flip the equation yeah, so that they drill. yeah, they already know how to deal with those things before they get placed with that kind of, you know, yeah, financial outcome. Yeah. And and we see this playing out in society as well yeah. where where those who fought in the war mm-hmm. are that example and yep. then our parents were the the baby boomers <laughs> and now it's us and then it'll be our kids who kind of mourn that which our parents let slip through their fingers. Yeah. So uh, onto some brighter <laughs> topics. Um, yes, <laughs> we're we're obviously you know we're we're parents. We're yep. in some people would call us a privileged position. Mm. I, I personally try to ban that word as well as luck in my family because <laughs> it creates more problems than it helps. But different cultures do the intergenerational wealth thing differently, right. and so I, I, yeah. I probably should acknowledge the fact that sometimes whether it is the way that you speak in your family or whether it's the culture that you're from, whatever it is, there are very ingrained patterns, personalities, yeah. and things that are even unseen that cause poverty to be, to be yes. transmitted rather than wealth. Yeah. And so I'm just saying that because I, I just feel like I need to acknowledge that, that yeah. you know we're coming from yeah. some perspectives which don't necessarily reflect yeah. all of society. Yeah. But it is so important, I think, that we're positioning our family line for success in Mm -hmm. the world to come. Right. Absolutely. Because we can't, uh, well, I certainly wouldn't want to be in a position where we have to be dependent on a government that's Mm. ill-equipped to deal with what they might need to deal with in the future. Absolutely. Um, Yeah. And I think it's important that you raise that because one thing that I have talked about before is whether it's from a cultural point of view in terms of how your family approaches money is different or it's a personal point of view. Um, If you are the person in your family group or wider network that is trying to buck the trend, whatever that trend may be, and in my life this has played out as being the kind of stingy auntie that doesn't buy presents because she's trying to encourage savings and investing behavior for children, you know, our nieces and nephews um, that they otherwise haven't been introduced to. That can, Are you that stingy auntie? I am. You, yeah, I good. am. I am. But, you know, <laughs> I've great. been battling this <laughs> way of thinking for five years and it is right. a pretty lonely road because if you are the person for whatever reason is kind of bucking the norm or trying to buck the norm within your mm. family group, you don't necessarily have the support of other people to do that. And I think it's just important to find, you know, in your own network, whether it literally be an online community, podcasts, whatever it may be, find the people that think in the same mindset as you because you always have a bit of headwind and, you know, you may feel like the only person that's trying to create change for your family, but I would encourage people to continue pushing down that path because it will pay dividends. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that. It, it is so easy to feel alone when you're leading in any area, right? Yes. Leaders are like the most lonely people there are in their chosen pursuit, whether it's yeah. finance or anything, right? Mm-hmm. But it's really hard when there's no – but the thing is, is that it should be hard because what you're pushing against could be a multi, multi-generational multi yeah. curse, basically. Exactly. And if you're going to break that, yep, you're going to get some resistance. And I know this mm-hmm. might sound a little bit strange to hear – hear someone talk like this, but you do have to stand against some things Mm -hmm. or else you'll be, well, you're going to be a slave to whatever you let control you. Mm -hmm. And if, if you, if, if it's too hard, then you're basically a slave to what laziness, slothfulness, right? (laughs) So yeah, like I'll echo what you just said. Yeah. Um, just some practical things like Mm. what, what would you say? This is a leading question, by the way. (laughs) I have an answer that I want to talk about more than I care about what you say, Kat. But no <laughs> what would you say to the the family who probably just has no wealth and no prospects? Like, 
how mm. how worthwhile of a pursuit is this to take the topic of intergenerational wealth seriously? Yeah. So I would say that the amount of money that you have in your bank account is no barrier to a future generation in your family to do better than where you are today and create wealth. The barrier that they are presented with is education and access to information, right? So if the only contribution that you feel you can make right now to better the generations, you know, behind you is creating education open conversation, um, you know, encouraging them down pathways that will give them opportunities to have better access to resources, then Mm. that is equally as powerful, if not more, like, powerful than just passing on money. Um, So that would kind of be the first one. I guess the second one would be for anyone that is sort of, you know, Gen X and below in New Zealand right now, we're all going to have KiwiSaver for our working lives, right? So don't necessarily look to your parents or grandparents as the model of what um, an asset base would look like in the future. We're Mm. all going to have KiwiSaver. It is predicted to be, for most people, one of their largest, if not their largest assets outside their home um, by the time that they come to retirement. And that's super powerful. So, you know, overall, I'd say, I hope people are positive and coming at this with a growth mindset, not a scarcity mindset. Um, yeah. But if all you feel like you can impart is education and knowledge or the access to that, then that's still a super big win. That's great. And and like talking about that KiwiSaver thing again, just to echo that, you're right. Like our wealth base, when we kick the bucket yes. and pass it on to the kids, it <laughs> yeah. will have- It'll keep, be our it, retirement savings. Yeah. Well, it'll, the, our wealth won't just be our own home. No. And that's it. Yeah. It'll be our own home and hopefully, hopefully at least a million dollars in your Kiwi Saver, yeah, right? Exactly. Um, especially if you use New Zealand's leading low-cost provider like Colonel, <laughs> right? That's oh. not, not a plug for you guys. Come on. You guys owe me one. But, but any yeah. of the great providers would be yes. good. <laughs> any low-cost great yeah. provider. And the, the one thing that I want to throw on top of this is that and this is something that we've done in our family. It's not for everybody and you got to mm. be really, really careful <laughs> I'll probably get in trouble for saying this because I, I, I know who's listening to this podcast, but the um, if, if you don't have an inheritance coming down from you, mm-hmm. but you have parents with a pulse, mm-hmm. you know where I'm going with this, yep. eh? <laughs> just get some life insurance on them, right? I know, I know this sounds really terrible. Calm down, calm down. But if let's just take it this way. Let's say yep. you have parents who are older and they've been mm-hmm. keeping their life insurance going for ages. And they're about to let it go. And you know, well, statistically, you've yeah. got maybe 10, 15 years to go. And I could probably get a level premium structure that yes. you know, play the cards well. It's just something to consider. Um, usually mm-hmm. when parents hit around that, mm. you know, 55 to 65 range, they start to trim these things. Yeah. And if their health has been good and their premiums are actually all right, in some mm. cases, you could actually rent an inheritance. Yeah. It's a gambling strategy, really. Interesting. Like, you know, I haven't really thought cons. about this in a while, but yeah. It works. Mm. It works. Mm. Um, it's not mm. It's not like the ultimate. And you do have to demonstrate an insurable interest for the insurance company. So yes. this is like way yeah. left field. Yeah. But I think it's just one of those practical things that you can mm. do to just understand all of the little hacks that there are yep. out there. Yep. And I don't know what you got to do to convince your parents to sign on the dotted line, but it's... Uh, <laughs> Hey, did I mention I sell insurance? Yeah. No, I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Love that one. Yeah. Any other mm. practical things that you, you can suggest that people should be at least doing or thinking about? Yeah. yeah. So I think going back to the conversations piece and something that you touched on about, I guess, you know, working with a financial advisor, mm. if you feel like you're not the best person to have or start the conversation with your children, why don't you bring them along to some other meetings, right? That's great. You know, because we often recommend this for, say, couples, whereby if you're not on the same page with your partner about money and you're finding that challenging, bring in a third party to, know, you know, basically broker that conversation. And I had also heard this recently from someone where they did bring along their 11-year-old to kind of their quarterly check-in with their financial advisor just so he could sit in the meeting and get a sense of like what was going on because 
It takes a little bit of the onus off you. It probably throws them in the deep end a little bit, but it will get their brain thinking and I guess open up potential conversation or lines of questions that could then help you as the parent go through that education process. That's good. Lean on other professionals to do some of the work for you. You do want to be educated because you want to make a proper choice, not just a default choice. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Let's not be default. Okay. That's awesome. Kat, we've, we've uh, probably gone over time, but that was a really good chat. Uh, thank you very Loved much. Loved it. it was All good. good. Thank you so much, Darcy. Cheers. No worries.